Uh, welcome to Savage Sessions episode number whatever the fuck it is, guys. At this point, I'm not keeping track. Uh, we don't have Bruce with us today. We got Wes with me behind the mic. Just kind of chilling. You want to say hi? What's up? <laughs> so today, uh, I recorded a really interesting training right before this, and it was continuing on this path of talking about like the mastery mindset. And it's been a really interesting process. So I wrote down before I hopped on here, kind of the way that I, I think that the way this comes to for almost all the students listening is how do we, how do we manage this process of anxiety when we're trying to make this career transition, right? If you need to change the camera or anything, that's cool too. So when we're in this process of trying to make these career transitions, right? Or maybe we're in a place where we're just upset financially. The way that I always handled anxiety in life was quite frankly, attaching it to some kind of goal, right? I didn't think around, I didn't sit around and think about how upset I was, right? So for example, a lot of people, what they'll do to kind of manage anxiety and stress is to sit around and play video games. I oddly got no judgment for it. I played World of Warcraft, Guild Wars, a whole bunch of those games for a very long time. I have no issue with it. I think the only thing I think is interesting for conversation is when you're in this process of making this transition, whether you join a program like DevSlopes or try and do it on your own, whatever it is, um, I think the path to like having a happy life is building an obsession, a mastery path, and a focus on building a craft. We have so many people, I talked about this the other day with Bruce, so many people right now are fed up with jobs. Like there's this ongoing TikTok trends of people saying, oh, these jobs fucking suck. I want my time off. The moment 5 p.m. hits, I'm not talking to anybody after this. And it's been like a consistent factor. And I think it's time that we open the dialogue for man. Is it the fact that, you know, humans don't like working or is it the fact that you haven't found something you actually like? And I really want to push this question back on everybody. And, uh, Mike Rowe is a guy that had a really interesting TV show a long time ago. He had the um, Dirty Jobs TV show. And he would go speak with plumbers, electricians, people who worked in sewers who had like the most disgusting jobs. And somehow they fucking loved their jobs, right? They enjoyed going to work every single day. And I think that's probably the neatest thing that we could think about, right? How were people who had some of the worst jobs so happy with their lives? And the reason why is because they were curious about what they did on a consistent basis. And I, I push that back to everybody listening. I think that this, the ability to kind of make a career transition from this zero to one level that we talked about in the last podcast, the only way it's possible is if, is if we accept that, accept the fact that this is a process that requires ruthless dedication. It's interesting because, for example, if you want to get into sales, it's pretty easy. Like to get a job as an associate, right? You can go get a job in retail sales, all of these things. But if you want to get a job in coding, it's a lot harder to kind of get that initial job unless you get a job in maybe like something baseline IT level supported. Like like we could talk, we could be talking help desk, help desk, maybe working like as a, a sales force, like lower level admin, admin job that maybe pays around like 60K a year. Like those things are much easier to get. And so... When I push it back to everybody, you know, how do we make this transition? It's about how we spend our time in this process. So I've noticed that a lot of the students or even people who are interested in learning how to code, what they're going to do is they're going to go through the course or whatever their curriculum is, like the DevSoups curriculum, and they passively watch it, click next video, watch it, next video. And when you treat it like that, you're treating it like a course. And I don't think that's a good thing. Right? They're not treating it like I'm becoming a software engineer. So right before this, I recorded our core training specifically on this topic in a little bit more kind of serious format. And I remember I had a conversation with Peter a long time ago. Peter's our CTO of DevSlopes. And he said something really interesting. He said, I asked him, I was like, hey, how do you feel about when people call you a coder versus a software engineer versus a programmer? And he said, man, the only people that call me coders are people that just don't really know what's happening. They're like, ah, you play on computers, <laughs> you're a coder. That's all it is, right? Then people that say programmer, like they're a little bit more educated, but still a really vague term. He was like, if I'm speaking to myself or about myself to professionals who are actually in this field, I say software engineer because I, pay, I take the past two decades of what I've done extremely seriously. This is a fucking profession for me. And I don't take this lightly. I say, I think if I call it a coding or I'm a coder, 
he said something along the lines of it's wildly disrespectful. Right, it's like saying uh, someone who's a filmmaker or an advertiser. Or, yeah, it'd be like, like camera guy compared yeah, to filmmaker. Yeah, you like a camera guy, right? Like, so for example, we had somebody at the house the other day. Um, I actually found it disrespectful what he said to you. They, so this person looks at Wes and he's like, "Oh yeah, you know, you've been doing a good job with the film stuff with Nathan." And I, I, I sat there and I wanted to be like, "Dude, don't you ever speak to my employees like that? Like that is so demeaning." Right, this individual kind of has his own thing going on, and he's had a lot of success for himself. And um, he's part of the community to where it's like, you know, be an entrepreneur, do your own things. Right? Don't be an entrepreneur. Don't try to, like, build your your brand within a business. Don't try to do those things. It's pretty stupid. I, I lean more towards that mentality. And it's it's really demeaning, not only towards yourself, but towards the the, the craft as a whole. Right? So I think it's really important that as we go along this journey, you say, I'm a software engineer. I am a JavaScript software engineer. I am a React engineer. I am a full stack software engineer. And that's what you push towards. Your entire life is based around that. So what you're going to do is you're going to find all the books. Like Clean Code um, is a must read for anybody who's wanting to get into the coding world, right? For sales, the arts of closing a deal. There's a million books on sales, right? In marketing, there's a famous book. Um, I have it right here somewhere. It's called... uh, Breakthrough advertising. I'm pretty sure it costs like three hundred dollars. It's like a, a a rite of passage. If you ever want to get into marketing or advertising, specifically copywriting, if you tell anybody you read that book, it's like a rite of passage. This person knows what he's talking about. And what's interesting about this is that's kind of also the way that you get your foot in the door. I know that for a fact. One of the things that stands out when I'm interviewing people, if they tell me that they're reading a book or they have read a book that I'm currently reading or I have read. I have an immediate connection with them. Um, when I had my divorce last year, uh, first divorce attorney I got was not ideal. It didn't work out too well. Um, we were going back and forth. Communication wasn't there. I was like, man, this is not it. There's too much on the line. So I switched divorce attorneys. I find the second one. And this guy essentially earned my business the moment I walked in. And the reason why is I walked in and I saw never split the difference from Chris Voss on his table. This is something I've been teaching all of our students in the freelancing portion. And when I saw that, I was like, oh man, I asked about the book. I was like, hey, I noticed that book right there. Uh, Are you reading it right now? He said, yes, amazing book on communication. He specifically said communication, not negotiation. Like the book literally says negotiation on it. But when you read it, you clearly see that this book is about communication, the ability to understand people more, the ability to show people that you understand what they're saying, you understand the emotions they're feeling, their state of mind, all of these things. And when you see that with somebody, that's how you know that they get it. So even though your skills may not be at that level, your le- your level of commitment to the craft is up here. And they could play the mentor to bridge the gap and help you move all the way up here. Like it's so crucial. So if you're showing up to job interviews, you say, man, I've read clean code. I've read this. I've read this. I've read the practical programmer. I've read all of these things. Um, it's going to stand out substantially. Like people who are obsessed with the crap craft, people who are obsessed with software engineering, people who are obsessed with this idea of becoming a master at what they do, they come together, right? So an example of this is if I'm in jujitsu, I'm speaking to somebody that has bought a video from somebody that I like, and we both start talking about it, and we just go back and forth on different ideas. That's how I know I'm in good hands, right? The people that I like to train with are always the people. It's like in jiu-jitsu, it's really common for people to just randomly give you stupid advice, like especially in the middle of training. Like y'all could be going back and forth all the time, especially at like the lower belts. Dude, it's it's incredibly annoying. They'll just randomly spout out information, and it makes me immediately not like them. Um, and for myself, I'm a brown belt. I'm pretty high level. Just about any black belt I go with, I'll beat them. And where I thought was things get really interesting is there's a lot of people who are blue belts or purple belts that I actually find I get lots of really helpful feedback from them because their specialties or their experience outweigh mine in different areas. And uh, the other day I was rolling with this guy named Mike. Mike just got his purple belt. He's one of the coaches here at Easton and he helped me a ton. So, uh, something I've struggled with a lot is choking people from the back for those that are listening to this if you just imagine any ufc fight when people are getting choked that's all it is like when they're on their back choking them out like this that's all it is so i'm sitting there talking to mike i'm like mike you know i was able to finally choke you right and he's been helping me really closely on this and i was like man what has it been 
And he was like, man, you're doing X, Y, Z really well. You're able to, your legs are holding me down. Your grips are getting really, really good. Um, you're just struggling trapping an arm. So eventually, so essentially what it is, is making it to where I have two hands fighting to choke their, their neck and they only have one hand to defend, right? It's a principle of what we're trying to get down to. It's just about efficiency. And he was like, I asked him, I was like, man, how do you do it so much easier? Because I can't. And he looked at me. He was like, dude, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, you just did it to me. I was like, dude, it's just not clicking for me. And it turns out the way that I was trying to do it, I was fundamentally, even though I was trying to do a choking action, I was doing something in the wrong way. And he sat down, helped me with it. And it goes in that reiteration process. The principles, the knowledge, the tactical experience to implement that knowledge and the practice I had I missed that tactical piece. So although I had the right principles and the right knowledge, the tactic I was using was wrong. So now remove the old tactic I was using, put the new tactic in, and now it goes back to practice. And as I practice, I go back to my principles, the knowledge I have, tactics, and I'm finding new areas to implement and, and change the way that I practice. And that's the process for people in this path of mastery. Every single day, you are looking for a new way, and a new area to improve. The core training video I shot with West right before this, this motherfucker the entire time was like looking behind me oddly in the back or looking at the camera. And I was like, this is making me nervous. What is happening? He was like, those small details the entire time. Yeah. Like um, if you're watching like the feed now, like you see, like you'll see how like the light is off, like in the corner instead of like under him. So it just like bothers me. That's what's funny, right? And that's what, I, like, for example, with myself, that's how I want to put myself around. Because I don't call my employees typically after hours, right? But when I do call them, I expect them to answer. You know, yesterday we, uh, we made, we're making some interesting changes within one of the departments. And two people are going to have to do a job different that they're technically above. And I spoke with them. I said, guys, I need you guys to both help me out in this specific area, right? We found a massive problem and I need you to do this. And they said, no doubt. We will. We are obsessed with Dev Slopes. We're obsessed with the success of it. We will do whatever is necessary for the company, right? That's that's what every employer is looking for. So it's, what's funny is I just saw this really interesting video. Um, it was a statistic that ninety six percent, ninety six percent of employers or employees are looking for new jobs in twenty twenty. Uh, let me see if I'll pull it back up. Give me just a moment. What do you think the cause of that is? They said what the cause was. It was a HBS. I think it was Harvard Business Review. I think it was Harvard Business Review. Let me see here. So long story short, they said that um, 96% of people were looking for new jobs. And the reason why was because they wanted to get paid more. 96%. The problem is this. Several years ago, everybody held companies hostage demanding increases in pay, right? Because COVID was happening, all kinds of things were happening, and there were, there were hiring issues, Right. So what, what's recently happened, we were moving into a really interesting state. The past three months specifically has been mass bulk firings at like every company across the board. When we go back a couple, maybe a year, a year and a half, all it was was everybody showing how to have two jobs, how to demand a, uh, a salary increase at work, how to get another job offer from another company that you're not gonna take, but to use it against your current employer to get an increase in pay, right? Uh, employer Employees were making it incredibly aggressive and they weren't thinking of ways to get win-win. So for example, when people come to me and ask for salary increases, I say, cool, explain to me why you think you should have that and just make it like, completely reasonable. Like if you could explain to me reasonably that you can get an increase in pay and you've delivered on XYZ, that's an easy conversation, actually. It's really not that hard. I can't justify saying no. Do you think that's like a unique thing to you and how you run your company? Potentially. Like, I'm also a CEO, so it's a little bit different. Like, I act as CMO, CEO. Um, so people will come to me. I'm a lot more, like, they're closely connected to me to where they can. Like, Bruce coming to me asking about something, right? Like, 
a lot more reasonable. Like if you're going to speak to middle management who has dead set budgets, it could be a little different. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about, hey, guys, I have improved. It, there's actually a, a much easier path to do this. But before I explain the tactic for asking for a raise in salary, it's important that we understand one thing. If you're at a job you don't like, you're, it's going to be hard to get that increase in salary. Right, because the way that you get an increase in salary and increase in pay is by improving performance. And if you don't like working there, are you going to put in the extra hours to increase your performance? Now, if you're at a job that you love, you're obsessed with it. Which most of our employees are. You're obsessed with it. Getting an increase in pay is a much different story. So here's how that conversation would go down. Let's say you came to me. You said, Nathan, um, I've been doing this now for a year. I think I've been doing an amazing job. Now, I know for a fact um, we've been having a lot of applications come in. By building your brand, it's having an impact on the business. I'd love to have a conversation on what you would need to measure to give me an increase in pay. right? Or what, would need, what I would need to deliver to get an increase in pay. And it's really important that we have this conversation ahead of time. You don't want to have this conversation when you need an increase in pay. Like You don't want to do that. Nathan, I've been working with the company for a year now. I'd love to know really what my core KPIs are, the core like measuring aspects, and what I can do to help improve that. And what I can do and what I would need to show you to justify a 10 to 20% increase in salary. You would need to say it exactly like that. And that's how, or whatever the number is. Hey, I'd love to make 60,000, 75,000, uh, 100,000 a year. What do I need to do to do that, right? Is there like a certain amount of time you should wait before you bring something like that up? Like you mentioned a year. Yeah, I think it really. Okay. So it's, so in your circumstance, right? You're coming from a job where you had no, like you had prior experience with cameras and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, You had no experience directly in what we're doing. I think about a year in is when you can have a conversation like that. Right. And the conversation, you can't expect a massive salary jump, Right. Um, but what you can say is th- the goal is to where you establish what's required for you to get an increase in pay so that not the first time you ask for an increase, the second, third, fourth time matters more. And also being with your. Where like you could hit like each of those points, like what is required and like, look, I've, I've been doing it if yeah. not above and beyond that. Yeah. And also it's important for some people to understand too. A lot. It seems like a lot of the times when people go ask for increases in pay. You okay? So there's a famous. Um, I I have to show you this to give context. So there's this famous thing that comes out came out a long time ago. And it talked about the conviction rate of people. Uh, they call it the hungry judge effect. The hungry judge effect is finding that judges were more inclined to be lenient after a meal, but more severe before the break. It has been suggested that this may be uh, an artifact of the scheduling of cases based on the likelihood of outcome. So I'm going to read the original study for you guys. This is off Wikipedia, so take that as you may, but there's a lot of books that have covered this, and this was last edited eight days ago. A study of the decisions of Israeli parole boards was made in 2011. The, this found that the granting of parole was 65% at the start of a session, but would drop to nearly zero before a meal break. So 65% of the people would be given probation, and it would nearly drop to zero before a meal break. The paper, Extraneous Factors and the Judicial Decisions, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, has been cited more than 1,380 times by 2021. Here's the hypothesis. The original paper suggested that mental depletions, mental depletion as a result of fatigue caused decisions to increasingly favor the status quo, while rest and replenishment then restored a willingness to make bold decisions. Later analysis and simulations suggested that the result may arise from scheduling priorities, that cases with a lenient outcome required more time, so they would not be scheduled in the time remaining before a break. The consequences. Interviews, 
Interventions of AI and algorithms in the court, such as Compass software, are usually motivated by hunger, hungry judge effect. However, some argue that the hungry judge effect is overstated. Um, so, point being, if you're going to ask for a raise, don't ask for a raise when your judge or when your um, when your individuals like when your manager is like trying to leave the office. Right. Right. Don't do it after you finish some heavy work. I can be a raging asshole sometimes if I get asked to do something at the wrong time. It's just like it's just the way it is, right? Um, two days ago, I was having a hell of a morning. If someone was to walk in and ask me something, actually, Bruce, actually, he asked me for uh, since he started the podcast, he asked for some kind of um, salary adjustment. We'll say that. And uh, I think I had like a hell of a morning, and he came to me and asked me, uh, and I specifically said, I was like, Bruce, as long as you ask me like that, the answer is no abundantly no um whenever you change the way that you ask we could have a conversation but as of now absolutely not um and i said that jokingly but i was serious i was like dude i'm not having this conversation right now um he took the hint and he was like all right we can chat about it later right easily so these are the things that do impact the ability to get that actually done right we have to be mindful about it same way when it comes to interviews i have a lot of people that i hired because they followed up with me three to four times after the interview. But they followed up in extremely respectful ways, right? Hey, notice we spent, first off, thank you so much for the interview yesterday. I look forward to hearing back from you. If there's anything I can do, let me know. P.S. Notice that you mentioned that you're worried about my experience in XYZ. Love to give you some context on my ideas on how to improve that, right? Um, then they would follow back a week later, three days later. Uh, two weeks later, they followed up ruthlessly, and that's why I ended up hiring a lot of them. They showed initiative. They were proactive. That's one of the values of the company. I want people that want to be here. If nobody follows up with me and they don't follow up with me after the interviews, I don't want them here. I want people at DevSlopes who are proactive, who don't have the ego of thinking, I shouldn't have to follow up with an interviewer, right? You shouldn't be here. So by showing that you're interested, that you want to be there, that's a big deal. Most people are really scared because they're like, I don't want to show off like I need the job. Um, employers want to show that you want to be there. So if you're showing up saying, I'm obsessed with what I do and I love where your company is going, I want to be there. What can I do? And they may say, Wes, you don't have the experience right now. And you say, cool, give me a little bit, of, just give me a hint of exactly what you want. It's an interesting thing because like, um, it's really hard to want to be at a job that you're not like passionate about or you don't have that drive for and i think like uh, a lot of people get trapped in that yep um man this is just another job this one's well paying this that like they want the the salary or the benefits or something like that but they don't actually really want the the job or the work i think it's pretty easy it's a deadline or choose to, to take a path of mastery on the side. Like the job that I had at the fucking call center after I quit the strength and conditioning work so I could focus on marketing, that job sucked, bro. Like that was not fun whatsoever. Like eight hours a day just answering calls from people who were upset about their, their electricity bills. Like, dude, fuck that. That was not fun. Um, then I also had a job at uh, Alamo Draft House on the side during that meantime. I was driving for Uber. Um, what matters is like if, if you're, if you're happy with where you are, there's nothing I can say, right? If you're content with the fact that you get benefits from that job and everything, cool. Best luck to you. Like I, I really got nothing for you in terms of like, like anything to say, but you, you can't complain about wanting something else. If you want to have a better life outside of that, it starts with audiobooks. It starts with podcasts. It starts with gaining a baseline understanding to where you then understand how you can practice it. So if it's marketing, how can you practice it? Well, I love jujitsu. I'm gonna go practice creating marketing content for my jujitsu gym, right? Um, I love marketing, so you know what? I, uh, I'm gonna go practice this with uh, somebody I know that has a side business. I love software engineering. I know a friend that has a chiropractic business. I'm gonna offer to do his website for free, add a whole bunch of features into it, find the designer that'll make it really pretty, um, and then get a before and after with him. Then after that, I can go charge a handful of people, maybe two, 300 bucks. I know that my friend over there has a Squarespace website. 
I know that it looks ugly. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be strategic about this. I'm going to show them, hey, did you see John's CrossFit website? It's pretty sick. What do you think about that? Dude, it's awesome. I, I actually hate my website. I wish it was a lot better. Tell me a little more about that. Yeah, dude. Well, he has the ability for people to schedule. It has auto-enrolling software on it. People can figure out when class times are. Mine's a little clunky. It loads slow. It's ugly. It's outdated. Got it. Crazy idea. What would you think about me custom building that for you? I'll do everything. This would probably cost a thousand, two thousand dollars at a minimum to have done professionally. I'm new, so it's gonna take me a little bit more time. But I want to do it all for you for like two hundred bucks. I just need to be able to get some money so I can prove that I can do this professionally. And I want you to write a review for me afterwards. How's that sound? We'll wait and see. You know, I'm kind of unsure about it. To be honest, you know, I don't know if it's worth it that much. Cool. Let's do this. Pay a hundred now. The last hundred when we're done. How's that sound? That's great. Bruce also had this really interesting approach um, that I, I, I thought was really great. And it was like, I'll go ahead, I'll do the portraits for you, I'll do the work, and you just kind of pay as you will. Pay what you think it's worth. And, I mean, you do leave yourself up to some people that'll be like, ah, I don't think it was good. But you never know. Someone could be like, oh, wow, this is great. Here's 400 bucks, and you were only going to ask for 100 200 Um and you also never know like the opportunities that come from that as well. Man, I actually think that's a perfect idea. So people don't understand the beginning of your career when you're at the zero phase and you don't have a lot going for yourself, you never got a job. When I say the zero phase, you have not gotten your first full-time job in software engineering paying at least sixty to ninety thousand dollars. That's what we're talking about. The thing that holds people back in this phase is um Man, I noticed this with Tyson. I'm, I, I'm, I'm excited for Tyson to listen to this. People will get caught up with the, the ego trap. I know what I'm worth, right? You're either going to do this or I'm not going to do it for you, right? Um, you want to only pay me 200 bucks? Like, that's crazy. Who do you think you are? The, I can do that now in my career, for example. I can justifiably tell somebody, I charge this per hour. You can either pay that or I'll move on, right? That's what you could do after you have real results behind you. I couldn't have done that even a year and a half, two years ago, like realistically. And, and DevSlips had done a couple million revenue per year at that point. It takes time. So when you're at the beginning stages, what you need to do is say, guys, my goal exclusively is to get experience. I don't really care that much about the income. You're not going to be telling this person, but this is the this is the principle. The principle for you getting that first job is get as many testimonials in the store as possible, in the door as possible that you could show future employers. That's realistically all you need. That's what this entire journey is about. As many testimonials in the door as possible, as much professional work, learn how to talk the talk through all the books that they're reading, go to Amazon, buy all the books, read all of them, and bring up those books in the job interviews. That's the secret. If you do that, that's going to stand out so much. Um, in fact, I'm actually going to call Peter. I want to ask him about that. I feel like that's a really good idea. Um, so you're getting there. You're having all the books that people are going to read on average in that in that in that scenario then you turn around and you have tons of work to show them and especially if you've done lots of free work too to show that you have the skills hey i'm hey can you hear me i'm gonna put you on speaker real fast i'm going with the podcast by myself today but i have a really interesting question for you that's actually practical software engineering so one of the things I was just talking about was people who are going in kind of for their first interviews with software engineering, right? Mm -hmm. um, number one, getting as much coding work in as possible, just like portfolio projects. Something that helped me a ton early in my career getting my first marketing job. What helped me the most was I consumed so many books and so many podcasts that I brought them up in the interviews and it's, that's what made me stand out so much. They're like, okay, this kid may not have the skills, but in terms of like dedication to the craft, he's listening to all the right resources. Like this shows that Absolutely. he's Absolutely. So if someone showed up to a job interview, let's say we're hiring a, a uh, junior front end developer, like a React developer, and they show up and they're saying they read the Pragmatic Programmer, 
uh, Clean Code and a couple other books, and they're actually talking about the impact it had on them, how would that change your impact on the interview versus somebody not bringing oh, that up? It's huge. If you think about what a junior engineer is actually able to do, it's really not much. You're, you're looking to help them grow. Uh, that's, that's really their place in the company. They're there to learn so they can contribute later. So when you hear that somebody is actually interested and is putting in time to learn and grow their skills, that's, that's incredibly valuable. So I guess what I'm getting from this is if someone shows up and shows that they've read those books, it's a game changer. Um, so we have Pragmatic Programmer. We have Clean Code. Do you have any basic book recommendations for software engineers that are at the junior level? I mean, there's a lot of them. Those are, those are some good ones I'd, I'd really recommend people do at first. Uh, re- really what was really important for me and w- when I was coming up is I was reading blog posts. I was going to meetups. Blog posts I from was, where and what meetups? Uh, so uh, whatever. So a JavaScript meetup would be good. A React meetup would be good. But really just kind of anything related to software engineering. So uh, there's tons of meetups around most somewhat major cities around software and it, it's one a good place to meet and network with people but also if you're part of those communities and you can talk about it it shows that you're not you're not just into this as a job you mm. you really want to make this your career and so let's take this step for, step further when it comes to resources to be like blogs to be paying attention to it seems like um like the original like react documentation website obviously for new updates hacker news seems like a good one probably yeah so it doesn't have to be uh react specific or javascript specific but just really what's happening in industry hacker news is a great place uh, there's some subreddits on reddit that are great uh discord communities uh slack communities forums there's there's a lot of places where you can go to really to see what's happening in industry uh people write things about patterns they've discovered or they're messing around with. And if, if you just kind of are able to understand and talk about that, it will grow your um, mind in this field. So I, I think that we talked about this in our podcast together. It's this idea of joining the community as a whole. You want to join the community and show that you're like truly committed to it. You're in the podcast or sorry, you're in the Slack communities, the discord communities, you're committing to them. Uh, you're trying to help with public GitHub re- repositories like you're doing everything across the board. You're reading books. That's what employees are looking for. Like that shows a really committed individual, right? Because we don't have much else to go off of. Your portfolio projects is probably very similar to a lot of other portfolio projects. Hmm. It's, it's really hard to differentiate yourself at the early, the early stages. I love that. Perfect. I'll, uh, I'll chat with you here in a bit. Thank you so much. Cool. See you. Bye. Okay. Um, I'm going to do the exact same thing now with Ethan, who is hired over like 20 sales reps for the company so far. Same thing for me. If I'm speaking to somebody in marketing, West, I looked at who he's following on YouTube. We talked about that. I looked at who he's following on Instagram. Connor, the exact same way, right? Like that's resourcefulness. Diving into those communities is literally everything. Yeah. Hey, I need you for just a moment. I'm gonna put you on speaker. I have it on the podcast. This is pretty simple. I, I, I need you literally for like two minutes. That's it. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm talking right now about the importance of when you're showing up to job interviews for a new job, how do you stand out? And what I came from, I just spoke with Peter about this for engineers. One of the biggest things I look at, and I talked about when I hired my divorce attorney, he had never split the difference on his book, his, his, uh, his desk right there. So we've already talked about, you know, maybe they have some experience before this, like it's not too much. But if you're in a job interview and someone starts talking about podcasts that you listen to related to sales or Zig Ziglar books or like really good sales books, how big of a difference does that make even though they don't have a ton of experience and they actually read them? Like for example, they don't say never split the differences in negotiation books. They say it's a great book on communication as a whole. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's huge for me because it shows that, yes, they're, they're lacking a little bit of experience, but they've done some due diligence to know what they're getting themselves into, that I can trust that they're going to put in the effort to be good at the job, and they're, they're building some of those fundamental skills. So let's say it's them versus somebody with maybe a year to six months of actual professional experience. Who would you likely roll with versus one who has actually read books 
and has shown a, like a commitment to the craft and a mastery level versus someone who has professional experience, who hasn't necessarily shown that, but at least they're proven. Yeah, I guess it would be, it really means what you mean by proven. So if they, if they have six months to a year under their belt and they've not already attempted to start learning more, i.e. from books, to me, that's probably a red flag. Whereas if the, the person who's hunting down experience, i.e. a job, and they're already doing the pre-work before they've been paid to do it, uh, that's huge. So let's assume, uh, let's, let's unpack that a little bit more. Let's say you're, you're you know, six months to a year in uh, your career. You've gotten experience, but you're not doing any work to really um, get better, right? You're not investing in yourself. I'm a little nervous that the experience you've gained is, is uh, not super credible, right? You may not be taking it too seriously. Whereas, uh, again, you're being paid to do this already. You're at another job, presumably, right? Um, uh, whereas the person who's already, they're doing the research, they're doing the effort, and they're hunting down experience. Do you remember the guy that we interviewed? That we interviewed somebody who was really polished with like three to eight years of experience in sales? Yeah, and they're awesome. And he literally told us, he was like, yeah, you know, I just don't really read books. I just learn stuff. Yeah, and, and honestly, I understand that temperament, right? Because you, there's this kind of uh, self-serving bias that, that we all have. That it's like, okay, you know, uh, I've done this enough. It makes sense to me. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm good enough. All these people are making this too complicated, right? I totally understand that sentiment. Um, but the, I guess the issue with that is you just, you kind of, you're just going to repeat your that first year over and over and over and over again. You're not getting your, you're not giving yourself any chance to get better. Perfect. Man, that's exactly what I needed. I'll, uh, I'll chat with you here in just a bit. Thank you. See you. And that's what I think all of this really comes down to at the end of the day. Your ability to bring in new information that challenges your principles, improves your knowledge, improves your tactics of implementing that knowledge, and then your ability to practice it. That's what obsession, mastery, and focusing on the craft is. It's taking all this new stuff, taking out a piece, putting a new one in, allow it, allowing reiteration. That individual we were thinking about hiring, man, he, he was polished, but he wouldn't have grown. In fact, he probably would have brought down the entire group because he would have refused to read our book of the month. I'm not going to allow anybody in the company that does that. And if you're a software engineer, the beautiful part about it is everything changes. Eight years ago, React was not around. Now it's the most in-demand front-end framework that is out there, right? That's amazing. It's changing so much. In sales, this is what's interesting. Everybody wants to listen to Grant Cardone or Jordan Belfort for some reason. Those are like the two sales people. Like if you're reading those two guys, you were like God's green, like special. Like honestly, you're the most basic person. Actually, you're the, you are a duplicate person of everybody that we interview. Um, one of the ways you stand out is the resources that you do read. Chris Voss never split the difference. Zig Ziglar. Um, I'm looking at all my sales books here. Pretty much books that you know are solid. You know J.J. Sutherland. That's an actually that's a different style of book. Um, you know, it's going out and finding more interesting things besides just Jordan Belfort and Grant Cardone. You know, showing that you the way that you determine somebody has real levels of obsession with a topic is when they move beyond the initial like thought leaders. So a great example of this, I feel like, is um, if you ask somebody who are their favorite music artists, if that person tells you Taylor Swift, you learned everything you need to know from them. Like they, they just like whatever newest pop songs are out. They don't really listen to music. They're just vibing to whatever the new stuff is, right? Um, versus if they tell you, hey, you know, one of my favorite artists, uh, rap artist is ASAP Rocky or ASAP Ferg or um, 504 or whatever versus them saying Drake. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. Like you don't listen to that much. Once you start getting into the subsets and the really specific, not necessarily niches, but the very specific categories within that general, that general category of sales or software engineering or react development. Once you get into those small subsets, that's when you start gaining respect as somebody who's obsessed with trying to get this down. And I think that this is probably the most, like this, this entire class is a master class on how to join the path to mastery, focusing on your craft 
and becoming obsessed, right? Find all the pod- podcasts. In fact, I'm opening up my phone right now. I'm opening up the podcast app. I open up the uh, podcast app on Spotify, and this is what I would do if I'm doing it for software engineering. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to browse. I'm gonna go down to. Dude, I haven't listened to podcasts in forever. It's been exclusive to audiobooks. Actually, we're gonna go to search. We're just gonna type in software engineering. Software engineering. Okay, popping it up. Software engineering daily. This one has 593 reviews at 4.5. And it says, Kubernetes cost management with Matt Ray. Learning from incidents with Nora Jones. Stream Dell, streaming data performance monitoring with Ustin Zarabin and Dan Salenz. Um, man, these are the type of podcasts you want to listen to. Then we can go a little bit further. React development. Would you be listening to these because they're in that genre of what you're looking for? Yeah. You know, what's funny is you're not going to understand any of it first. <laughs> that's, that's where things are really interesting. You're not going to understand any of it right now. The goal is for you to start getting it later on. Like you're just everything. Okay. You're not going to get it now. Right. Uh, the goal is for it to start just getting in your mind. So it's kind of like if you're learning a new language. Um, so Here's the, the idea is you listen to something that's completely new to you, all of it will seem foreign, then you will start picking up on specific words they're going to use over and over again, then you're going to go Google what that word or what that phrase is or what that language is, and you're going to be like, oh, got it, know what that is now. Um, so in marketing, they talked about native ads for a long time. I uh, didn't know what that was, and I Googled it, and it's like, oh, it's ads that look like they match with the, uh, the news feed and stuff like that. So this, uh, the React show. Discuss about React, JavaScript, and web development by React experts with a focus on diving deep into learning React and discussing what it looks like, what it's like to work within the React industry. Um, this is common. They have like ongoing episodes that go out. This is, would be a great podcast to listen to, most likely. Um, only nine ratings, but man, you know, it's, it's consistent. You want to find the ones that are extremely popular. So I just found one. Latest episode was 2015. Definitely not the one you want to go at. But that's the process you want to go to, right? You want to find all the things that are wildly popular, um, all the YouTube channels that are wildly popular. Um, I also think it's really important to find like uh, people who resonate with you, because whether that's like I'm watching like photography tutorials from one guy or a different guy, one guy like he could be dropping all kinds of very useful like information, but like something about it, like his style, the way that he presents himself or talks, it like doesn't resonate with me. So there's like certain people, 100%. Um, I don't know, that I kind of like gravitate towards. Yeah, that's what's really neat actually. So I think that your ability just to have that conversation is really important. So for example, um, a lot of people like so they'll be the mainstream podcast you should be listening to, even though you don't like like them that much. Like so, I've actually listened to a bunch of the Grant Cardone books. I've read Jordan Belfort's uh, "The Wolf, The Wolf's Way" or whatever the fucking book's called. I listen to both, and when I talk to people, when I interview sales reps, I'm like, yeah, you know, the book was good. I lean more towards like somebody like Chris Voss. Uh, I just prefer his energy, everything as a whole. Um, I, I've I've implemented it. It's a lot easier. I'm not really a big fan of the way that Grant Cardone teaches sales or implementation. I do love the structure of the way he does it and the mentality though for both of them. I think they're amazing, right? From that aspect, that's what I prefer from them. And so being able to have that conversation, what do you prefer? What do you like? What are you not a big fan of? And you don't want to do it like, Oh no, I can't stand them. Like I can't stand Cardone, but I'm not going to typically say that if I'm speaking to somebody professionally, right? Um, I also think like um, the guest on the podcast is super important. Like, yeah. Um, for instance, like Joe Rogan, like a lot of the stuff, like I have a hard time getting into. Um, and like that's dependent on like the guest, but like certain episodes where like people that I like from YouTube or other things come on the podcast, I am so like entertained, 100%. captivated. Um, and I, That's the cool part, right? Like that's how you start figuring out the, the funny part is when you do this, it's like you're going to a university, 
Like whenever you start learning these subsets, the goal is the entire purpose of all this stuff is in an interview. You want to find the resource that both you and the interviewer click on. It's the same thing as saying that you both love a really unique song or artist or like both of you love something like really niche that no one else likes. So uh, ironically, one of the things I like the most about Kayla is she listened to a lot of like the music that I listen to with rap that most people don't listen to. And I was like, fuck yeah, that's awesome. Most people don't do that. And there's immediate connection there because of that. You want to find that one thing, right? So maybe it's a specific filmmaker that you liked on YouTube and someone from the gym randomly brought that up. You're like, fuck yeah, dude, I listened to that too. Like, what do you like about him? Did you watch the recent video? Uh, if it's sports, dude, if I have somebody finally bring up sports, dude, dev slips for the longest time. No one cared about sports. Now it's just a whole bunch of <laughs> like meatheads almost that love it. We can start having a conversation about it. Like that's, that's what all of this is about. The ability to build rapport and really connect with somebody to show that you understand them. They understand you. And it's a lot easier for them to want to offer that job to you because they can see themselves working with you. They can see themselves working late hours with you. They could see you fitting into the culture. They could see developing you. That's what all this is about. Will I want to work with this person? Will this person work their ass off? Will they believe in what we're doing? Will this person dedicate? uh, Are they worth me investing my time and effort into? Would I invite this person over to me and my spouse's house to have dinner with? Am I going to want to take him out for lunch a handful of times a week? Like if you're not going to want to do any of those things, it's not going to work. I wouldn't have hired you and invited you into my house if I didn't want to have you here. You know what I mean? Right. That's what all of this is about. Um, guys, I think we're going to wrap it up today. How long was that? This was a long episode, wasn't it? Yeah, we're going on 46 minutes. That's it? I feel like it was a lot longer than that. Well, guys, that is a wrap for today. So, Thank you so much for listening. I think this is going to be almost probably one of the best episodes regarding this. Refer back to it 24-7. Um, we're going to be posting the core training on this that's probably going to be broken down to about five to eight minutes in a much more strategic manner. Uh, with a little bit more stories from me on this process of self-mastery. Check that out on the DevSlopes channel for DevSlopes or my personal Nathan Savage. And we'll uh, see you in the next episode. Have a good one, guys.